Uh, well, I'm pleased to be here. I'm not quite sure how to answer the question of what is reinforcement learning. But there was a lot of exchange back and forth within our panel before we came here, and uh, I'm at a loss to give you a, an answer that will please all or even most of you. Uh, instead, I'm going to answer, I'm trying to answer this question. How does mainstream theory and RL practice connect? And I, I want to argue that not well, not well at all. And I'll illustrate this with an example that comes out of uh, my relatively recent experience. So, um, okay, I'm going to take you into symbols and math, but this is a very elementary uh, figure that most of you that have studied enforcement initially have seen before, perhaps with different symbols. Um, this involves approximation in value space, and the and there's a system equation here, you know by F, this is an old symbol. There's a G cost function, like Leslie <laughs> said, there's a G, which was used for many, many years before reinforcement learning came along. And I'm going to consider a discounted problem or over an infinite horizon that has an alpha discount. And uh, a lot of reinforcement learning revolves around this figure. We replace the optimal cost function in Bellman's equation with some approximation. That's what's called approximation in value space. We approximate J star, the value function, with a J tilde. And we minimize like we would in, in, in dynamic programming, exact dynamic programming, except that this approximation J tilde. So basically, at any state that we are, we minimize the weighted sum uh, the, the sum of uh, two components, the cost of the first step and then the future as approximated with this J tilde. And W here is a random variable. So there's an expected value with respect to W. If there's no randomness, then you don't need this expected value. Now, this is a model for much of reinforcement learning. And there's a critical mapping involved here. How does your approximation, J tilde, affect the end result? which is the policy that you get. That's the question you're interested in. How does all the stuff that you approximate affect the quality of the, of the, of the policy that you obtain, this new tilde? So what the critical mapping is the, the one that maps approximation error, J tilde from J star, to performance error, the cost of this policy new tilde, which I call J mu tilde minus J star. That's what, that's the core question. And, um, and so we have this one step look ahead policy. There may be multi step look ahead, which I'm not going to give because it's too long. And uh, you, have this, um, you have this mapping. The key question is what's the relation between, between J mu tilde, the performance uh, function, and the cost approximation? And, um, and also, if there's multi-step look ahead, how does it affect this relation? Okay, so there's a standard approach to this question, which is the linear error-bound model. It says that the approximation error and the performance error are related by some kind of a linear relation. And there's a certain classical bound, it's from the 60s, it's a folk theorem here, from the 60s that says that the ratio of these two is bounded, something that depends on alpha. L is the length of the look ahead. So with more look ahead, the bound improves. And there's a linear relationship, and this quantity here is the slope of this line. And now, this is an old bound, but in our book, some of these were original, and we were taking great proud of them. We thought this was some of the core results of our book. We, of course, we knew very well that these are bounds are conservative. Uh, they are, um, they, the real relationship is, the real relationship lies much lower than this bound. However, we thought that, broadly speaking, they are qualitatively correct. Even though this bound is not exact, it gives you the rough, the, the general trend and the, some kind of a qualitatively correct result. Now, the real, 
The reality, I found out relatively recently while teaching reinforcement learning at ASU, the reality is far different. This, this bound is, has no connection to reality. The relationship is not linear at all. And the, the bound is not only unrealistic, they are, it's misleading. It takes you along conceptually wrong paths. And uh, in this sense, they misdirect theoretical research and also confuse the practitioners. The true relation is not linear, but rather it is super linear. And uh, for one step, look ahead, it looks like this. In other words, flow, if you make a small approximation error, then you will get, make a very tiny error in performance. It's going to be almost optimal in this region, no matter how large the approximation, as long as you stay within stability region or region of convergence. And uh, there's also another region where if you go by even moderate amounts to improve the approximation error, you gain nothing. The error is catastrophically large. And uh, now if you use multi-step look ahead, there's a better curve, okay? Still the same shape, but a better looking curve. <coughs> and the key fact is, if you know, if you know about optimization, numerical analysis and so on, this will remind you of Newton's method. That's how the way Newton's method works. One iteration of Newton's method works like this. And the critical fact is that the mapping that, that takes approximation error to performance error is a Newton step for solving the Bellman equation. In the case of multi-step look ahead, it's a Newton SOR step. SOR stands for successive over relaxation. It involves a Newton step, but preceded by a number of first order iterations. And that's what shifts the curve towards the right. Okay, so now this, I think, has far reaching implications for both theory and practice. It says that if you are in the good region, the region of convergence of Newton's method, it doesn't make, it doesn't make a difference how long you train, how you improve your confidence bound, you're going to do very, very well. On the other hand, if you are outside, in the instability region, then no matter what you do, you're stuck. There's nothing you can do with collecting more data and things like that. And there's also a middle region where you might get lucky and have good performance, but not always. So there's some convergence threshold here, which is defined by the region of convergence of Newton's method. And, uh, and marginal effects within the two regions, there's marginal effects with all the tricks, the math tricks that, and data collection tricks that you can play uh, to have a marginal effect. And there's a critical stability threshold for at least for undiscounted problems. Discounted problems are always lead to stable contraction mapping, stable equations, and so on. So just to give you a, a simple figure, this is a, a linear quadratic problem involving a one-dimensional system, one step look ahead, but the system is unstable, uh, left uncontrolled, and the problem is undiscounted. This is what the error bound gives you, the classical error bounds, the bound that everybody relies on for other analysis. And the actual error, you can calculate it here, and it looks like that, it has no relationship. This bound has no relationship to reality. Moreover, uh, there's some nuances to this, uh, to this error bound. For example, the bound on the, on the right is much better than the, than the bound on the left. And if you study Newton's method, you will see why this is true. And you will also see the, here this asymptote, which is the region of stability. If your approximation error is on this side of this stability threshold, then no matter what you do, you're going to get an unstable system. Okay, so this is some of the details of this example, and you can find more in my recent book on Alpha Zero. Um, now, okay, this explains observations that I've been holding, that I've been collecting since the 90s, okay? And all of this is consistent, all of this is consistent with, uh, with this experience, but there's an interesting computational study that came out a few months ago uh, from Berkeley. Russell and Dragan are 
two professors at the ES department. Russell, of course, is a prominent figure in artificial intelligence. Light Lowe is a graduate student, apparently. And they conducted a the most extensive computational study on reinforcement learning methods and problems. They compiled a data set of 155 MDPs, some of them very large, and gleaned out of data sets that were benchmarks that were available in the literature. And here are some quotations from this paper. There's a large gap between the current theory and practice of RL. Deep RL works impressively in some environments and fails catastrophically in others. Current theory does not have the ability to predict this. We find that prior bounds do not correlate well with when deep reinforcement learning succeeds or fails. And they have, they have empirical findings, and, they, and the, the principal finding is that an important mechanism to make methods work is to increase the length of Laguka head, like alpha zero. People believe that alpha zero succeeds because it has huge look ahead. There are a number of ways you can increase look ahead, including rollout with some policy. So to them, this is the key, and that's what the computational results bring out. The quality of the approximation doesn't matter as long as the look ahead is long enough. And uh, okay, so they reached some conclusions about uh, the look ahead, and I'm not quite sure I agree with us with this, but one result that stands out is that with long enough look ahead, regardless of the approximation error, an exactly optimal policy is obtained. And incidentally, this is a theoretical fact, so that's where theory comes in. A theoretical fact known since the 60s. So, okay, so I'm going to stop here because Very my chairman demands Professor it. Versikas. I'm done.